Well, good morning. I could send you home after that. That was pretty great. So today we're going to talk about this. Somebody said okay. So uh, I don't blame him. I'm ready to go home too. Let's just go. Uh, today we're going to talk about stepping out in faith. Believe it or not, this subject has been a struggle for many theologians. And so I think with my ADD, I have simplified it in a way that no other theologian, no other great theologian has ever simplified it. They, they compare faith and works to scissors. Which side of the scissor do you need? To which my mom said, well, that's not applicable at all, which was hilarious. And, um, but yet, uh, Luther struggled with this. If you remember, um, Luther um, was the one who understood faith and, and how we're saved by faith. And his big deal was about faith. So when he read James, he said, I'm not sure James should be in the Bible. I mean, it doesn't seem to, to be the same. And so today I'm going to show how faith and works are not polar opposites. They are the same. It's one conversation. And so I'm going to give you just a simple illustration to help you. And obviously this is my wife's purse, although by the color of my computer you couldn't tell. But there you go. So, um, you know, when you were, how many of you had a lunchbox when you were a kid? Anybody besides me have a Scooby-Doo lunchbox? Anybody besides me? Ah, Scooby-Doo. Good to see you. I love my Scooby-Doo lunchbox. Had the thermos with the thing on top, and you could fill it with uh, uh, a drink or, on cold days, <laughs> some nice soup, right? A little vegetable soup, which was, tastes like the can back in the old days. So I put a couple things in here this morning, just things that I can, you know, like to snack on. So, of course, snack pack, you got to have a snack pack. Now, if I could have, I would have brought a little, uh, what is it called, that has the crackers and the cheese and everything. Lunchable. Kids, that's just the thing now. Kids just, because mom and dads are like, bonk, right? But when you were a kid, they like made a sandwich and threw some stuff. So you got this. And then, of course, I like, I like to snack on string cheese, a little mozzarella. Mozzarella uh, string cheese. That's always fun. Did my mic cut out all of a sudden? That was weird. Um, no, they just turned me down because I'm so loud. I don't blame them. So here's the question for you to help you understand faith and works. You ready for this? Do you? Feed your children or love them? Let me ask it another way. Do you love the people around you or do you make sure they're fed? Which one? Well, obviously, that's the dumbest question you've ever heard. And when we talk about faith and works, it's the same thing. And this is why Luther struggled because he said, well, well, works isn't required for salvation. You are right. You do not have to feed your kids in order to love them. By the way, in Florida this week, a lady went to jail for starving one of her children to death. I am sure she said, I love my child. No, you didn't love your child. Why? Because you would put your child before your own needs if you love your children, and, and we understand that. I mean, there's just something in us that understands you're not a good mom if you don't feed your... What is wrong with you is what we want to say, right? And yet we have such a hard time understanding faith and works. But it's the same idea. If you really care about somebody, if you really love them, Jesus said it very simply, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. But I'm going to show you some things in here because some of you, the difficulty is that you, um, when we talk about faith and works, you start to think, think, well, maybe I'm not a Christian. And Billy Graham said it years ago. He said, uh, Satan wants you to convince you that you're a Christian when you're not. And he wants to convince you that you're not when you are. And so I'm going to give you a few things, just some tests for you to look at some things that you can deal with. But let me, let me tell you something about life as we're going to talk about this first point. Allow your faith to fuel obedience. Years ago, I uh, uh, moved into an apartment and for several days took cold showers, did not have time to fix the water heater. Finally, had some time and I had worked with a plumber so I knew just enough to be dangerous. So I got my screwdriver out and went towards the 220 powered yeah, I did, towards the 220 powered 
water heater. So it had a little warning on the outside. You will die if you open up this cover. So after I opened up the cover, inside it had another sign that said, you really are going to die if you open up this thing. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just going to turn the breaker off. And so I went over to the breaker box, and it was already off. I turned it on, and I could hear when I turned it on. So I did what every man in the world does. I did, and you know what I'm about to say. I did what every man does, fixed it like I had done some great deed besides taking cold showers with my family for several days. How exciting that was, by the way fixed it. So what was wrong? There was no power to it. Listen, some people, the reason that you're not carrying out works is because you've never become a Christian. You never have given your life to Jesus. But sometimes it's because you're not abiding in Christ. Maybe at one time you were, but but lately you've gotten away from abiding in Christ. And there's actually some verses that remind us to not get tired of doing what's right. And so we're going to look at all of that today and kind of put all this in a box. But remember, faith and works hand in hand. Do you love that person or do you want to feed them? That, that shouldn't be a mutually exclusive question. Do you have faith or do you have works? Yes. So here we go. Let's pick up with this. Number one, allow your faith to fuel obedience. What good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister, and that's talking about your Christian brothers or sisters. So he's especially pointing out if you know somebody, if you're close to somebody, and they say this to you, there's out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. Now, I don't know if your children have come to you and said, Father, Mother, I am hungry. I hope you didn't just look at them and say, be well fed. It's like Ernie and Bert back in the old days of Sesame Street. Ernie wakes up in the middle of the night and tells Bert, I am hungry, Bert. And of course, I cannot do a Bert impression. Bert says, we'll get something to eat. And Ernie says, I'm too tired to get up. And then Ernie says, I got an idea. I'll just imagine making myself a peanut butter, and I believe it was banana, sandwich. And he imagines eating it and drives Bert crazy, of course. And guess what? He's still hungry. So the idea here is you can't just say to somebody, well, hope you're all right. And then it continues. But does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So let me ask you a question. How many in here have ever run out of gas somewhere? Never? Some of you have never? Okay. I'm glad the liars finally raised their hands. All right. So here, here's the truth. Now, how many of you ever ran out of gas in a convenient place? You were in a convenient place. Right, just happened to be. I remember the 70s. I don't know if you remember the 70s. I'm showing my age. In Miami, there was a gas shortage. I don't know if you remember that. And we had Ayatollah dartboards. If you didn't remember that, you, you're not as old as I am. I'm really showing my age. So I remember in Miami, Laura, you probably remember this too. You had odd and even numbers. And whatever your number was, odd or even, you got to go like Tuesday, Thursday or Wednesday, Friday, and I don't know what they did with the extra day. Just, you can't get gas on Saturday. I'm not sure what it was, but, but you had to go on your day. Well, here's what was happening. People were pulling up to the gas station. There were huge lines, and while they were in line, half a mile from the pump, guess what would happen? Run out of gas. So guess what they had to do? Push their car. If you are trying to do works in your own strength, and you're not relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, or you've gotten away from your fellowship with God, and yet you're trying to do religious things, it is going to feel like pushing a car. You're like, oh, I'm so tired of this. And just to give you an idea, this happened in the first century. Listen to what it says in Galatians. And by the way, this is Paul, who 
many theologians are like, well, Paul has an opposite view of James. No, he doesn't. Listen to what Paul says here. Let us not become weary in doing good. Why? For at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. Think about what that's saying. See, see the law of the harvest is this. You reap more than you sow, and you reap later than you sow, right? And so there's this waiting time for what you're planting that you don't see any results. And so he says, hey, you'll reap a harvest, but don't give up. Why? Because a lot of people give up before they get there. And then it continues, therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. And then I love this, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, let me tell you something that I have figured out, and maybe you figured it out. You ready? It takes work to be around people. There are days that you and I, the pastor, does not want to be around people. You ever not want to be, anybody in here ever not want to be around people? Ralph, now I'm really going to hit close to home. You ever had somebody, a friend of yours, cancel a, a get-together and you went, whew, oh, so glad. Now I don't have to do I don't have to shower. I can just, whatever, right? Netflix, whatever it is, just leave me alone. And we've got a lot of leave me alone. They've actually done studies now that people would rather not work with others than work with others. How's that for our society, right? And so the truth is, we sometimes grow weary in doing good. Why? Because it takes work. Every one of you this morning had a choice to make. You got up. Sorry, people online. You just pretend you're here too. I'm just pretending all of you are sick. All right, so, so you got up this morning and you had to say, shower, I hope, deodorant, hopefully, brush teeth, possibly, right? You, you had work to do, some of you more than others. Now, I don't understand why us men aren't spending more time than the women, because as Jim Gaffigan says, we're the ones who really need the time, right? And so the truth is, right, it's work to get ready to get out with people. But there's something about connecting with other people. Why? You can't even know what somebody's needs are if you never talk to them. I called somebody yesterday, and, I, and uh, I said, hey, we haven't talked in a while, and I just wanted to see how you're doing. And they said, I've been in the hospital. They didn't tell me they were in the hospital. They didn't tell anybody else. And here's what I said to them. Well, I've been in the hospital three times. Which hospital were you in? Maybe I could have walked down the hall and visited you. To which they said, I didn't know you'd been in the hospital. And I thought, it's because we haven't talked. If you isolate yourself from other people, you cannot live out these verses. Did you hear me? And it is work today to get to know your neighbors. They run from you. I love that I've gotten to know my neighbors. I have a neighbor right now. He's in Hawaii. They take a trip to Hawaii every year. So I egg their house every... No, no, I'm just kidding. So every year they... Remember egging houses? Okay, sorry. Every year, they go to Hawaii. So every year, now, he's gotten to know me. He sends me a text that says, hey, I'm going out of town. You keep an eye on my house. So while he's out of town, I take my lawnmower. I run through his driveway. I grew up in Miami. So what do we do for people from Miami? We drag our garbage can over to our neighbor's house so it looks like they're home. We blow off the driveway so it looks like that. That's it. We're not doing anything else. That's all they get, right? So I get, a, I get a text, hey, did you just run through my driveway on your lawnmower? He has a ring doorbell, apparently. So yesterday, as I drove through there with the bell, I waved at the airway. So I get a text, hey, thanks for saying hi, aloha. Aloha. And then I egg their house. No, I didn't. Our priorities, honestly, are shown in what we do. If you are posting or wearing your political opinions, but you have not told anybody about Jesus, you're telling everybody else that you love politicians more than you love Jesus. Ouch. No, I'm not. Really? If you love me, Jesus said, you'll obey my commandments. What's one of his commandments? Go and make disciples. What does that mean? You have to tell other people about him. You have to let people know about him. Sometimes we are more proud of our political position than we are of our faith. So which one is really our priority? Let's be honest. Come on, just be honest. Do you feed your children or do you love your children? Oh, well, I, it's both. 
can we see it? Those of you who know me know I love my little puppies. And little Buster has scarcity mindset. So he will, we will have three bowls of food. We got three dogs. We got three bowls of food. And if there's any bowl empty in the house, Buster will go and stand in the bowl, scrape the bowl with his little paws, and look at me like, hey, we got to keep these babies full over here. Now the other bowl's full to the top, but Buster's like, we got to fill this up. And I got to tell you, I go and fill up the stupid bowl for the dumb dog. Why? Because I care about my dumb dog. Can we care about Jesus as much as we care about our dumb pets? Can we care about other people? I said to my wife last week, you know, one of my goals is to be as nice to people as I am to my puppy. Isn't that sad? Sometimes I have to, that, that raises the bar. But our priorities show. I want to give you one challenge this week. Calendar a person to bless this week. Now, if you don't know what I mean, here's what I mean by calendar it. Figure out when you're going to do it. Why? Because we don't do 100% of the things we don't plan to do. And we do about 80% of the stuff we plan to do, right? Hopefully. And, and so I want to encourage you, even if you just think about it during church or if you can put it in on your phone, maybe it's Tuesday, maybe it's Monday, maybe it's today. Hey, I'm going to call so-and-so who I've not seen in a while. I'm going to check on so-and-so. Hey, I'm going to check on that brother or sister who I'm the one who always calls. But I'm going to call them today anyway, right? I'm going to go out of my way. Maybe there's a neighbor, maybe there's a friend, maybe there's somebody that you say, hey, you know what, you want to go to lunch? Calendar a way to bless somebody this week. And it's amazing, when I called this person yesterday, I said, hey, I just haven't talked to you in a while, and they said they've been in the hospital. I was like, oh, no idea. And so I was able to talk to them and pray with them. You never know what happens when you open communication with other people. Listen to what Peter Lord said, if this doesn't convict you. What you believe is what you do. The rest is just religious talk. So if I followed you around, would there be any proof that you're a believer? Would there be any proof by how you treat other people? Would there be any proof by the way you talk, by the things you do? Ready for this? This is going to hurt. Buckle up. By the things you post, that you are a true believer. Number two. Discover ways to believe and do. I had a college uh, uh, pastor tell me this. He said, when we get to heaven, we're going to have flat heads. And I'm trying to figure out what verse he's talking about. Like, is there some scripture that I have totally missed that's talking about flat-headed people in heaven. I mean, what in the world? And, he, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, because when we get to heaven, we're going to realize we put our faith in Christ and we were right about that. But we were wrong about so many other things that we go, oh, oh. What about the dinosaurs? Oh. What about creation? Oh. What about the Nephilim? Oh, you know, we don't, you don't care about that, right? Listen to this, James 2. But some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe and shudder. Basically, he's saying, the demons have better, <laughs> the, the demons have just as good understanding as you do, but they don't show it, they don't demonstrate it. It's not all about getting your theology perfect. And then he continues, you foolish person, do you want evidence? Faith without deeds is useless. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and actions were working together. Do you feed your kids or love your kids? Well, yeah. And his faith was made complete, and that's the word justified, by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Now listen, <laughs> Abraham was super messed up. You read the story of Abraham and you're like, I would never do that. You're like, on my worst day, 
And my voice cracked just saying worst. On my worst day, I wouldn't do those things. And yet what happened? God called him his friend. Why? Because he pursued a relationship with God. Did he get it all right? No. Will you get it all right? No. When you get to heaven, will some of your theology be off? Absolutely. I'm going to get to heaven and be like, well, no, I really thought. Martin Luther got to heaven, had said the book of James is not a good book. He had to meet James. James walked up to him and said, what are you doing criticizing that? That's the best letter I wrote. What is wrong with you? And he's like, right? The truth is there's a lot of things that we believe we get it wrong. But the most important thing is, do you believe that Jesus died on a cross, rose again, and when he says to you, follow me, are you willing to surrender your life to him? And the Bible says when you do that, because he died and rose again, and when you believe that and you surrender your life to him, the Bible says your old person goes away, the spirit comes in you, gives you a new way of living, new power, new strength, new goals, new life, new beginnings. So that even if you don't get it all right, when you get that right, guess what? Faith and obedience working hand in hand, what happens? When you get to heaven, yeah, you're still going to go, oh, I, yeah, I. But the good news is you'll get there. And one day we'll sit together and talk to each other. In 1 John, it says this, and talking about people who think they're Christians, but their lives don't show it. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and don't live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And what happens? The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, don't take this the wrong way. This thing that says walk in darkness, it doesn't mean that we don't trip as believers. It doesn't mean that we don't fall. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle. It doesn't mean that we don't have to get things right with God. But it means if we pursue sin, if you have no conscience about sin, then maybe you should start to think, maybe I'm not a believer. If you have no desire to do what God's called you to do, maybe the first question needs to be, am I really a Christian? But if you fall and fail and confess, then just make it right. That's our next challenge. Listen, confess and repent of any disobedience. Remember, it's not just your works that show that you're a Christian. What do I mean? You can feed people and not care a thing about them. But if you love them, you'll feed them. You can feed your children and not even like them. But if you love your kids, what are you going to do? You're going to feed your kids. All right, number three, your actions reflect your beliefs. You see, that person is considered or shown righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Now, this is Jericho. The spies came in. She hid the spies. She risked death. And later we find out she put her faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, right? She puts her faith in Christ. And what happens? We see in the New Testament, she just kind of works out to be in the lineage of some guy that we've heard of named Jesus. Even though she did not have her act together, what'd she do? She showed by faith. She took a step of faith. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And I would say if you don't have any reflection, any signs in your life that you're alive in Christ, either you've never given your life to Jesus Christ or you're not abiding in him. You've disconnected from the vine. You've gotten busy with life. You've gotten distracted by things. You've gotten angry over something. You've forgotten to forgive somebody and you've gotten away from his power. Well, go back home. Go back home. For it is by grace, Ephesians says, you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, listen, not of works, so that no one can boast. And then it says this, if you think Paul is contradicting himself, then he says this, for we are God's handiwork, which means you've been knitted together by God, but for what purpose? Created in Christ Jesus, listen to what it says, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
So Paul says, you're saved by faith, faith in Christ. And once you're saved by faith, what happens? The actions flow out of your faith. Because you've turned the breaker on. Because you've filled up the tank. Because you've said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I surrender to you. And on the days that you realize that you've quit surrendering to him, and we all have those days, you say, Father, forgive me. I surrender to you fresh and new again. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the power to live the Christian life. Why? Because selfish gravity grabs a hold of all of us. Pulls us down on this earth all the time. And so we have to recognize that selfishness and that self-centeredness, confess it to him, and say, God, would you help me to live by the power of your spirit? The final thought today is this. I want you to thank God for his grace and salvation. Do you have faith or do you have works? Yes. Do you feed your kids or do you love them? Yes. If you love God, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. So you just begin to say, God, would you help me to walk in your path? If you're here today and you're not sure you have a relationship with Christ, today would be the day that you say, God, I don't know if I have a relationship with you, but I, all the things Eric said earlier about salvation, I believe, and so I surrender my life to you today. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. I'd love to talk to you after the service. We can talk about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're here today, and as a Christian, the truth is you've become selfish and self-centered. Confess it. Make it right. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. We love you, Lord. And Father, we're all on, if we're all honest, we, we don't get it right sometimes. Lord, sometimes we, in our own selfishness and self-centeredness, we pull away from you. We go our own way. But Father, you said when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So give us your power today. Lord, thank you for each one. I pray that all of us would be examples of you, would walk in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great